Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, we're continuing our study of uh, the book of Acts. And this is the third uh, session. So if you did not see the first two videos, uh, you can go back and watch it all from the beginning. They're uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. We've been working our way through the book of Acts, starting with Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and going through it uh, carefully. Uh, and, and we just finished Acts 2.38 yesterday. So today we're going to pick up with Acts 2.39. Uh, but before we get started, let me just ask Brother Joe, just to uh, say hi to everybody. Hello, this is uh, Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel. And it's a channel for fellowship and learning. And uh, very excited about uh, the book of Acts, probably the most exciting uh, historical chapter in the Bible. So uh, just looking forward to uh, continuing on, Luke. We learned quite a few things yesterday, I think. Yes, yes, we did it. Uh, all right, well, um, in Acts 2.38, of course, uh, it, it, it turns out it's one of the, I would say one of the most controversial verses in the whole Bible in terms of that so many people use that verse to uh, to teach um, repent of your sins for salvation, to teach baptismal regeneration. A couple of heresies come out of that, that one verse there. But uh, so we covered that, and uh, and now we're we're ready to move on. So let's go to Acts two thirty nine. I I read it first in the KJV, and then we may look at also in the Amplified. Um, Sometimes the Amplified can be helpful. Okay, verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this uh, untoward generation. Um. All right, let me ask you, let's just go with those two verses there, brother. What are your thoughts on 39 and 40? There's the mute button. Uh, yeah, you know, this is uh, this chapter is ripe with uh, opportunities for people to uh, develop aberrant uh, teachings. Uh, this is a, a verse where uh, both predestination people and... Uh, some some other uh, mistaken ideas come from. Um, I th I think it's just a, a the this Holy Spirit is being given, and it's a it's a promise that uh, He will be available through all the generations uh, uh, to the coming of the Lord to the second coming of the Lord. Okay. Uh this verse here, I, 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 I'm speculating on a couple of points here. And it says, verse 39, for the promise is unto you. Uh, it had just finished talking about um, the very last phrase was at the end of verse 38 was, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, and then the next thing is for the promise is unto you. So I think this promise is, uh, is is referencing back to the Holy Ghost, um, that you'll receive the Holy Ghost. Actually, it was promised from Jesus not, not that uh, long ago in, in terms of just, just before this event at Pentecost, uh, just bef uh, before Jesus' ascension. You know, we have his resurrection, and then for 40 days he's with them, teaching them, and proving himself by showing himself bodily, and then he ascended. But during those 40 days, he talked about the Holy Ghost would be coming to go in Jerusalem and wait. Uh, so I think that in verse 39, when it says, for the promises unto you, that's, that's uh, the fact that Jesus promised them that the Holy Ghost would be coming to them. Uh, and to your children, and to all that are afar off. Uh, now, uh, we discussed last time that when Peter was preaching to this uh, large crowd of people, he spoke 
I believe he spoke in his language, but then these people who didn't understand Hebrew from, they were from all over uh, uh, various countries in the region there. And many of them, they didn't even speak Hebrew because it was very common for the Jews who had been dispersed. Uh, they, historians refer to these people as the Hellenized Jews. Uh, they, um, they, were, they were influenced by uh, you know, Greek culture. And they learned Greek and other languages, but they didn't even know Hebrew. And so here Peter is speaking in his language, and yet all of those who spoke various languages, they understood him as though he was speaking their language. So, but when he's talking to those people, we noted last time that these people are all Jews. It, it says right in the context there that they're Jews. Um, um, but here we look at verse 39 and it, and it says, and that are afar off. And it says, and to all that are afar off. So it could be very easily, um, I think, interpreted, but I think wrongly, that the people who are afar off could be maybe Gentiles. Uh, a Mormon would say, those people are far off, that those are the people in, in North America, you know, that Jesus is going to go preach to, you know, how Mormons, uh, they, when Jesus talked about how he was, he had, uh, how was the phrase, uh, the verse, uh, uh, another flock, he said, he had another flock, that, uh, they, they believe that that's the the North American natives. Uh, but so some people could say, who are these people? And to all that are, are far off. Well, I don't think it's the Native Americans. I don't think it's uh, Gentiles around the world. I think it's just more Jewish people that are located in other places. Because at this point, it hasn't been divulged to Peter or anybody that this, they don't have any clue at this point that the gospel now is, is really intended for the Gentiles too. Um, and it says, uh, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. Of course, um, he calls everybody. Uh, and he draws everybody. Jesus said when he was, uh, he says, uh, just as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, referring to his crucifixion. And, and he said, in that manner, I will draw all men to myself. So, and the Bible says, God does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's clear to me that God the Father and Jesus Christ, they desire all of us. He's calling all of us. He's drawing all of us, but not all of us answer the call. We have a free will uh, choice to uh, b believe in him or not. Um, so that's verse more on verse 39. Uh, uh, verse 40 save yourselves from this untoward generation. Um, well, oftentimes when we see the word save, I mean, it's, it's a reflex that people think we're talking about salvation, but um, I, I don't get the sense that this type of saving is salvation. It says, and with many other words, we testify and exhort. So Peter gave this long speech and, and, and then it's saying here, he said even more. So we don't have the whole speech that Peter made. He says, and many other words that he testify and exhort. So I'd like to know what else he said, but uh, he was saying, he, in other words, he said this, but he expounded on it further. He says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. I'd like to get your thoughts on what I said about verse 39 and also get your thoughts on the end of verse 40 a little bit more if you could, brother. Yeah, Luke, I appreciate you trying to save me there. Uh, I was listening to you, but I wasn't listening. I was reading uh, verse 39 at chapter 5. And so while I was reading verse 39 on chapter 5, I really was tuning you out and reading it for myself. And the verse I was reading, but if it uh, be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest uh, happily you found even to fight against God. It was a whole different verse that I was commenting on and a whole different uh, part of the book. I'm sorry. That was my comment was uh, related to verse 39, chapter five. Uh, getting back to the proper verse, uh, I think you did a fine job of uh, of commenting on what I should have been commenting on, and and I'm just going to give it back to you. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you. That was that was very funny. Uh, 
that you're on the wrong, wrong chapter. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can laugh at me next time I, I make a mistake like that. Okay, let me go on to verse uh, 41. Well, let's see what it, how it says it in the Amplified, 39 and 40. Uh, 39. Uh, for the promise of the Holy Spirit, so they're, they're in agreement that this is a reference to the, the Holy Spirit. The, for the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and for all who are, are far away, including the Gentiles. Okay, see, now this is where I would have to disagree. They are uh, interpreting this uh, for as, as uh, the, the Gentiles. But again, I, I, I couldn't disagree more that there's no indication that they, anybody has a clue that the Gentiles are included yet. And then it says, as many as the Lord our God calls to himself. And Peter solemnly testified and continued to admonish and urge them with many more words saying, be saved from this crooked and unjust just generation. Um, the only thing we didn't really answer was the end of verse 40, when it says, be saved from this crooked and unjust generation. Um, do you want to, let's back up just for a moment there and see if you have any thoughts on that. I, I have an idea, but I'm not so sure about it. About it. What do you, well, say? I, 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 you know, before uh, yesterday, I would have, uh, and I think I did, I, I basically read what the Amplified Version said. Uh, in my commentary, because I, I had always thought, uh, I think it was probably according to Strong's, that uh, that this was this group included Jews and Gentiles, and I think you uh, solidly prove that it it was primarily just a Jewish audience, and so taking that into account, uh, verse forty, I, I think, is referring to the fact that the, the Jewish nation. And further reinforcing your thought, that this is primarily Jews. The Jewish nation is responsible for crucifying Christ, and uh, and and you know calling them crooked uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, such is obviously uh, Peter's way of letting them know. Listen, you guys, you just crucified the Messiah. Uh, save yourselves from this nation, uh, this generation of the nation. I believe, and. Uh, that's my thought. Hey, Ted. Hmm. All right. That's good. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not that clear. Uh, you, you may very well be right on the end of verse 40 there, but I'm not so confident in that. But let me, let's me uh, let welcome Brother Ted here. Hi, Brother Ted. We're on Acts 2, uh, Chapter 2. We just discussed uh, verse 39 and 40, so we'll go on from there. But uh, why don't you say hi to everybody? Introduce yourself. Well, I'll be... Uh... Uh, just screenshot only here. Um, uh, this is Brother Ted, and I'm here in Texas. And the name of my channel is God's Truth Ministries, and I'm really uh, excited to be able to join. Sorry for being a little late, but I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to this. Thanks, Luke. All right. Yeah. Welcome. And uh, boy, I I would have loved to get your thoughts on uh, verse 38 yesterday, as as we discussed it. I. I think we did a very thorough job on it, but I, I thought maybe you or Brother Bill could have had some other insights that would have been helpful. But I don't want to go back, so let's just go to verse 41. It says, um, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's 41 and 42. Um, let me ask you guys uh, to make a decision here uh, uh, on, on the order. Do you have any preference on who wants to uh, address the verse first? Yeah, I have Joe go first. That's my preference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, brothers, brothers. You're appointed. You're appointed. You're appointed. Okay. Well, if that's the case, Ted needs to comment on verse 39 in chapter 5, uh, following me. But anyway, uh, on this verse, I, I think what this is uh, is denoting is that they stayed with the faith. I mean, you, you remember Christ talked about some of the seed fell on hard ground and didn't grow, and, and different types of people who hear the gospel. And I think this is uh, showing us that, number one, there was a great crowd to hear 
Peter out the window of a sec probably a second story uh, room, and uh, uh, and many people mocked and turned away, but of the crowd that it, that saw and experienced uh, God that day, uh, three thousand were converted, and and in real conversion. Uh, I think it, it's it's telling us that they uh, they continued in communion and they steadfast uh, with the doctrine. That means they were true conversions that uh, stayed in the body of Christ. Of course, once truly converted, you would. But uh, uh, that's my thoughts. Back to you. Hmm. Very interesting, uh, brother Ted. What are your thoughts on those two verses? Well, it seems to me it's like a promise. Uh, you know the the. Peter, you know, and I'm sorry I missed uh, yesterday, had way too much going on, uh, but um, obviously it's a promise. The, the salvation by grace through faith has always been a promise, and uh, that, of course, kicks it back to the controversy of verse 38. I'm sure you guys got through that, that that's not a, a works salvation type of situation that Peter's putting forth here. Some of the Paul only, as, as I'm sure you know, Luke, from your dealings with them, will say, if you encounter a Church of Christ person that, you know, says that uh, baptism and, and these promises are by works, well, it's not. Peter clearly says, as he continues on there in verse 39 and 40, the promises to you and to your children. And the, the, these people, these uh, Jews of dispersion throughout all these lands, obviously knew that uh, the promise to Abraham that was that the just, you know, that people are, justified by faith. The just shall live by faith. That was the theme all through the patriarchs, starting with Abraham, and the promise was even given to Adam and Eve that uh, the deliverer would, would crush the serpent's head. It was always a promise that something God was going to do, not what man has to work for. And uh, it was promised to, to the forefathers, it was promised to their children, verse 39, and to all who are far off, and even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So I think we're going to even see, as the revelation comes later, that the Gentiles are included, that uh, the, the things about the Gentiles, you know, like in Isaiah, laud him, all ye Gentiles, with his people. Uh, the promise by justification through faith that Peter talks about here is whosoever is going to call on the name of the Lord. And he just uh, continued on there, and with many other words he did testify and exhort, save yourselves from this untoward generation, this crooked generation, I think my new King James says. Uh, this, is, this is free will, and this is justification by faith, just in these two verses. So there's no salvation by works in these verses, and this is, this is a glorious testimony to the sacrifice of Christ and the promise of God of salvation by grace. Brother, back to you. Mm. Um, well, I, I found that very interesting. Well, first of all, you commented on uh, the two prior verses that uh, we wanted to look at 41 and 42, but you went to 39 and 40. But that I'm glad you did because you had a different uh, interpretation on on 39 than I did, and um, I'm not sure who's right. I mean, I think there's an, an argument for each. When, when, we, when it says the promise, you could, could very well be right that this is reference to the promise of, from uh, God made to Abraham, that we know is that that's what, that's what it all boils down to, that God promised that the salvation would come through uh, uh, the seed of Abraham, and this is what they've all looked for, look forward to, and now we look back and say, it's, it, it's finished, Jesus is the promised one. Uh, so when, whenever we see the term, the promise, uh, I'm surprised I didn't think of that. Joe didn't think of it either. Neither one of us connected in that way. But how I interpret the promise was connecting it to the prior verse because it says that the Holy, the Holy Ghost. Uh, let me see. Let me get. The, make sure I got it exactly right here. Because you, you joined us right after I discussed that. It said um, verse 39 for the. No, ver, I'm going to start with the end of verse 38. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, remember, Jesus promised them the Holy Ghost would be coming and, and to wait for them in Jerusalem for it. So when it says, for the promises unto you and to your children, <clears throat> I was connecting the promise to the Holy Ghost that Jesus had told them, uh, you know, to go and wait for it. 
Uh, so you may very well be right that the promise is referencing the promise to Abraham. Um, and so, but that's the main main distinction I see in, in, in the, uh, the way you interpret that. Now, why don't you take an opportunity to talk about verse uh, 40, uh, 41 and 42. Those are the two verses that I, I expect you to comment on. Oh, okay, brother. Sorry about that. I was, I've been busy, busy, busy all morning here. Well, this is my morning. When you get when you get in bed at eight thirty in the morning, uh, you know, uh, two thirty in the afternoon, uh, four thirty in the afternoon is your morning. Uh, so, forty and forty one, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourselves from this untoward generation." Then they gladly received his word, were baptized the same day, were added to them about three thousand souls. Continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. Well, I'm going to say right off that that's not a uh, that's not a uh, verse, and there's not a passage there that, uh, some people use this passage, verse 45 specifically, I know you're going to get into that, that uh, some real fringe groups, like uh, I think Jim Jones of Jonestown, where he had all those people com commit suicide in Africa, they, they did what they call communal living, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that if it's done benevolently, benevolently like they did here in Acts, but uh, I don't think we can take this passage and uh, and go that far, but uh, obviously the ones who received his word were baptized, uh, and you know my position on uh, on souls and so forth. I'm going to say where it says added to them about three thousand souls. I mean just that means three thousand lives, three thousand people, and continuing in the the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Uh, means uh, they were they were committed believers. They weren't just lone rangers. I think a lot of us nowadays there's a tendency to just see the errors among Christian leaders and and uh, some some problems that we have with some churches' doctrines and just be kind of lone rangers um, and not be accountable to anybody. I mean, to me, this is kind of like church. What we do here, uh, we try to be accountable to each other, accountable to the word. Uh, which is the, the word of the Lord, so that's being accountable to the Lord. So I think that's important. Um, and they continued steadfastly in the doctrine. There wasn't just uh, a bunch of guys flying by the seat of their pants. There was doctrine going on there. There was fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. They were committing these things to the Lord and committing these their lives to the apostles' doctrines, uh, which came from the Lord himself. Um, I'll let you comment on that. I'll, I'll say some more if you want. Uh, you know, a lot of interesting points. Um, b before I respond, though, let me ask see if Brother Joe wants to uh, re respond to what you said. Go ahead, Brother Joe. Well, I, I uh, am amazed. Uh, Ted came up with some really, really good uh, points there that, that I had not considered. Uh, I, I kind of did, did a surface uh, uh, commentary. And, and like I said, I, I think that, you know, there was a very large crowd there, and 3,000 uh, of them uh, truly, truly entered into the body of Christ. And uh, it's showing that they, they continued in communion as well as in, in doctrine, and uh, they were seeds that fell on good ground. Back to you. Okay, now... Um I don't know uh, how you how you got out of those uh, two verses the communal living part yet uh, that's coming up and I think it's coming up very soon if I remember correctly <clears throat> but I don't see the uh, the case for communal living yet even though uh, very soon they're going to talk about how they sold other goods and shared but uh, the the thing that stands out to me uh, on these verses and I uh, maybe is it can't hurt to go back to Acts 2, 238, I mean, it's such an important verse. So many, two major heresies come out of that verse alone. And, and one, one is that repent, they interpret it, repent to be, to uh, repent of your sins, change your lives, you know, that, that kind of thing, rather than repent meaning, as, as uh, I'll get your thoughts on this since you didn't get a chance yesterday, but in my my teaching on it yesterday, I'm emphasized if you if you take that verse and realize that it's based upon the speech he just made. 
So if you get the proper context, he's telling them to repent, which simply means to change your mind uh, based upon everything he just told them. Uh, he, he convicted them. He, he condemned them. He says, you, you, uh, uh, you did all these things. You rejected Jesus. You know, you, and I referred, I said, some of these people might even been those that were uh, in the court, courtyard saying, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. And so, and so he's pointing out at these people and saying, you rejected the Messiah. Now you need to repent of that and admit you're wrong and, and say he is the promised one. So that's the essence of the word repent, not stop sinning. And then the other heresy that comes out of that 238 is baptismal regeneration. And because it says, it repent and be baptized, and I, I talk quite a bit about the error of baptismal reg regeneration, and then the error that uh, uh, the opposite side, the Paul only is uses, they, they take the exact opposite approach, saying um, not only is this saying not 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 teaching that baptism is required, but you need to understand that baptism is actually forbidden. It's it was only for the Jews. It's not for us, and you better not ever get wet. So you have two extreme viewpoints. The Paul only is say, stay away from baptism, and, and, and the baptismal generous to say, this is how you get saved. It's get when you get wet is is when when you get saved. If you don't if you don't get wet, you're not going to be saved. So I address those two errors that were in that verse, but now in this next verse we have baptism brought up again, and that's why it's important to discuss this again. Because uh, twice we have baptism, and people will say, well, see how important baptism is. And the point I made, and I want you to give your thoughts on that, is, of course, is that baptism, water baptism is not required to get saved. But we shouldn't react to the other extreme and say baptism is forbidden. We should have a, a, a middle ground saying that you don't have to get baptized. You're saved before you get wet. But but baptism is is. Uh, we're told to be water baptized because it's a way of us publicly uh, saying, I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed, you know, I believe in Jesus, and I'm not afraid to say it publicly. And it's, uh, it's symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's all symbolic of our, our, our being immersed into Christ. So um, uh, the, it's, it's just important when we see baptism twice within these few verses, people can take this as an extreme viewpoint that uh, elevating water baptism to a height that the, the second century church was, the, that was the biggest error of the second century church, thinking that baptism and Holy Communion, these sacraments are the means of salvation. All right, uh, Brother Ted, what, why don't you respond to all of that? Amen. Well, excellent word, brother. And, uh... Yeah, I, 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 uh, a couple of things about that. I'm in, I'm in total agreement with you on all of that, brother. Um, you know, the thing about, I, I really wish I would have been in on yesterday's, but it, circumstances just didn't permit it. Uh, when he talks about repent there, and as I'm sure you went through Acts 2, uh, Peter, you know, he goes through the prophecy about, about Joel, and he's, he, he, he really, uh, goes through the, the prophecies and, and what's what this is a fulfillment of and what they're seeing. And when he gets to verse 21, and I, I'm sure you covered this, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As you've said before, Luke, in your studies, it's obvious that salvation is by grace through faith. Uh, it's whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, even even from Peter. That didn't just come from Paul. That came from from back in Joel and Isaiah and and. And now Peter's reiterating that, verse 21. It's obvious how, how his starting point is. He's saying, look, what you guys are seeing, this mighty rushing wind, these men talking in tongues, these signs, these fulfillments, the, the fulfillments of prophecy that you guys should know, ye men of Israel scattered all about. You know, and he says, uh, and, when, and when he gets to verse 22, he just lays it out. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. And then he starts out with these three words, Luke. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, and boy, just that slogan, that that statement right there, those three words, I think just like hushed the crowd. That that those were just either kind of you know swear words back in that time. It was either love him or hate him, you know. And uh, 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by signs and wonders. You guys knew this. You guys saw this. He did it in the midst of you, all throughout Galilee, all throughout Palestine, all throughout Israel and Judah. Christ was doing signs. You yourselves know this. But he, he says, he was him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and ye there. I like the King James for the, for the ye's because that means plural. It's like here in the south we'd say y'all. Y'all have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. He's hammering them right off. But by the time he gets to verse 38, I'll skip through all that. Uh, 36, you know, God made him, uh, who you crucified. There it is again, ye, y'all have crucified. God's made him Lord in Christ. So Peter's laying the foundation. But he began the foundation by laying uh, with, it's whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. He's never put works. Salvation has never been by works. Salvation and, and for forgiveness or remission of sins, however you want to say it, has always, always, always been. And this is what the, the guys need to get that are uh, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, Catholics, anybody that believes in baptismal regeneration or baptism required for salvation. You know, getting wet, like you said, I like that slogan, but getting wet. You know, they think you got to get wet. Well, God has always had a blood economy. It's always been a blood, even from Adam and Eve. What, what's the first thing God did? He made them coats of skins. God made the first sacrifice. God made the first sacrifice to make skins for them. And think about this. He said, you know, to Abraham, God himself shall provide a lamb, you know. I think in the King, King James, it even says it more emphatically. It, it almost sounds like God himself is the sacrifice, is the lamb. You know, and um, God, all through Leviticus, all through the, the Old Testament, some people get tired of it because, golly, it's bloody. Blood this, blood that, blood, blood, blood. Yeah, that's the thing. That's what he's trying to drill in our heads, that God's always had a blood economy for forgiveness of sins. Something has to pay the death price, <laughs> you know, and... Um, when he says repent, we obviously know that means change your mind. John the Baptist was saying repent. Change your mind in regards to this coming Messiah. You know, there are some contexts in the Bible that say, you know, it seems to say repent means turn from a certain way, but that has to be taken in its context. But repent, metanoia, means change of mind, to rethink things, to think again. It means just to change your mind from the way you've been thinking. And the context is change your mind about Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 22. So change your mind about him and, and believe on him, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, when he says, repent, change your mind, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, I tell somebody, I, I put it like this. I ask somebody who believes in baptismal regeneration and things like that. I say, have you ever taken an aspirin for a headache? <laughs> you know, have you ever done, uh, you know, have you ever done something like that? Have you ever taken, uh, you know, Pepto-Bismol for a stomachache? You don't take something in order to get a headache. That's what they say. You need to be baptized in order to get forgiveness. You know, Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 says, and Romans 4 says. Did Christ die in order for us to get to sin? <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. The context clearly dictates in the light of blood, God's blood economy and Christ being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We we are baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. Even when John the Baptist showed up on the scenes, God had been remitting their sins for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and John the Baptist says, you only need to be baptized because God's been remitting your sins and overlooking them and get ready for the Messiah to come. And he's going to be what? He's going to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The letter to the Hebrews, the Hebrews, Israelites, right, says Christ himself uh, was the one who took away our sins. And it says he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He did all this by himself. So for obviously means because of. Repent obviously means change your mind. And I bet you covered all that yesterday, Luke, but I'll, I'll let it go back to you. Thanks, brother. Hmm. Well, I'm disappointed. I, I, I wish you had been a little more thorough there. That was a joke. Brother Joe, did you get that joke? You're the only one who understands I, I, uh, I certainly did. I was just going to say, Ted is in teaching mode and uh, doing a great job. You know, Ted, uh, I don't know if it was during the show or, or during a private chat, but 
at some point it was lamented that you wouldn't uh, be there for such a important part of this book and, and now I certainly have that reinforced uh, you know the nuances and the things you bring to the discussion are amazing uh, truly uh, a lot of nuance and, and a lot of things that that we didn't cover uh, that uh, are certainly significant so uh, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad uh, Luke thought to go back to that most important section of verses so that we could get that exact input. Uh, awesome. You know, <clears throat> a few nights ago I, I was uh, just, just doing a little bit of studying and, and uh, in regards to what you were saying about the, the, the sacrifice of Christ, the, the, the cost of blood that, that God has always uh, made evident. You know, I, I was reading <clears throat> something I've read a million times before, not to get off track, but uh, just a rabbit hole that I remembered from a couple nights ago after you speaking. Uh, it says where Christ is born, it says uh, the angels said that, you know, uh, a child is born and a son is given. And I was reading that section of verse that I've read a million times. And I realized that's not the same event. And so I started going down that rabbit hole. And a son is given relates to 33 years later. And I found out 33 miles or thereabouts, very close, between where he was born and Golgotha, where he was sacrificed. A son was, is given, refers to Christ laying down his life. At, at the, our behalf. So uh, everything you said was just uh, oil. Back to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, yeah, Brother Ted, when, when you said that uh, you're you're confident I cover it all. I did. We were, we're we're in complete agreement on everything. But again, it's wonderful to have your way of expressing it. As Brother Joe said, your nuances. It's, it's all very helping, and it's also just reaffirming everything we've we've said uh, yesterday. I'm going to read the next verse now. Uh, verse uh, uh, 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and all things common and sold their possessions and goods, and part of them to all men, as every man had need." Okay, there's a, a portion of scriptures that you were uh, referencing about uh, communal living. So uh, go ahead, Brother Joe. It, it reminds me of uh, every conversion that I've ever seen, where uh, you're so in love with God, uh, and uh, and so uh, renewed, uh, your mind has been changed, as as uh, uh, Ted just said. And these people, in, in this time, actually took that uh, literally into the next step, and just uh, became a body, became became one. And and their their passion was so great that uh, it, it sounds to me like those three thousand people that were scattered from all the nations uh, that came together and, and received Christ that day uh, it sounds like they put down roots and uh, and and uh, found a new home and and uh, and I don't know if they forsook what they had or where they had been but it sounds to me like they just uh, immediately wanted to have a church that never closed uh, that's real passion Hmm, yeah. Okay. Very good. And brother Ted, what are your thoughts on those verses? Well, yeah. Excellent. Excellent thoughts there, Joe. About uh, you know uh, people just surrendered. And what what I have a sense there of is that we we have to look at that in in the light of the Jews that were there from all these regions. I mean. Their whole thing, even the disciples, you know, right before Jesus left, you know, I think they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, and Jesus, of course, said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. But these people uh, that came and uh, 
followed steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines and fellowships and uh, continually breaking bread and prayers. Uh, I think their mindset, brothers, was uh, the kingdom. You know, the kingdom, it, it's, it's, you know, why not sell all, all our possessions? We've got nothing to lose because the kingdom might be imminent right now. I mean, he might come back now, this Jesus of Nazareth, set up his kingdom, and, and we've got nothing to lose. And this is what we've been waiting for. Uh, the Old Testament talks about, uh, you know, obviously some of these, these men among the 3,000 were, were prominent men, probably uh, uh, Pharisees or scribes or, or certain uh, religious Levites and so forth or priests and uh, many of them from these other regions and uh, probably just thought, hey, you know, we're believers now that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth <laughs> is the Messiah. We've identified with him. That's one thing I didn't say about baptism. Was, a, baptism was an absolute identification. I'm sure you uh, know this, Luke, that when they dyed garments over, in the, and, and still to this day when you dye a garment, it's just a white linen garment. You dip it in a, in a purple dye or a blue dye or whatever. It completely identifies with that color. There's, there's no mistaking of, of what it is now. Same thing with baptism. These, these men completely identified with Christ through baptism and then completely identified with their fellow believers there uh, and continued with the apostles. Fear came upon every soul. Signs and wonders were done. They had all things common. And I think their, their, their thoughts were, brothers, uh, what have we got to lose? Uh, we might as well sell everything because the, the kingdom's at hand. Let's, let's go for it. And they were just all in. Back to you. Hmm. Well, th this whole uh, portion of verses, <clears throat> I guess, starting with verse, uh, uh, you know, forty or so, uh, it's it's describing an amazing event and transformation of, of uh, attitudes and minds and uh, the uh, what's that word uh, in uh, Romans? I have a T-shirt with that on it. It says, uh, uh, "Be not conformed to the, this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." I think I, I didn't quote it right, but the point is, it seemed like they were really transformed. This, first of all, look at the number of people. How how many times do you think there were three thousand conversions at one time? And and then and then at that, on top of that, that the, these people were so converted. That uh, they, in the in the following description is it just everything about it tells us that they were absolutely committed and, and uh, really like a hundred percent in into this. The one interesting thing that I find is not said there that I think we can learn a lot from is uh, I don't see anything um, that should lead us to believe that these people were ever instructed to sell their goods. They, Peter, the apostles, nobody said, sell your goods, and we're going communal. Um, it seems to me this was just like a, 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 like a universal mind switch that uh, everybody decided just to, to do it. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, we have families that we love. Or, you know, we have a, an immediate family, and, and, and then we have an extended family, then we have friendships, and then we have our nations. But these these closest relationships, uh, I, 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 there's no question that I'm going to share everything I have with them. You know, my wife, my son, my immediate family. You know, what what's what's mine is theirs if they have a need. And so I think that this was they truly were brothers and sisters. It was it, that was the kind of thing that that happened in their the way they viewed things, their relationship. So they started selling their property and just sharing it. So whoever had a need, uh, if you had more than you needed, you, you, you share it with people who needed. And what a beautiful thing. This is, uh, this is the first example that I can think of in all of history. Now, there may be some extra biblical writings that, we, that, I, that I'm not familiar with, but this is the first example that I know of of a, a communist state being formed, and uh, I, I've always believed that 
the communism is the ideal state, and that's probably kind of be what it'll be like in eternity, where we don't, we don't, we're not greedy for possessing possessions. That uh, it's trying to acquire more and more for ourselves is, is would not be the way that we think about things. And that, um, but so communism is ideal, but unfortunately, it's not realistic because uh, man's flesh. <laughs> it doesn't take long. Uh, for uh, the flesh to interfere with this this generosity and d desire to share. And matter of fact, after this particular description of this communal living here, I get no indication that this is an ongoing thing that lasted for years. It may have lasted for a week, a month, a few months, but I get the impression from the, all the scripture I, I, that, that this was a short <laughs> span of communism, and it didn't take long before. Uh, well, we got the example already of you know uh, the, the, those characters, what their names are coming up. Uh, uh, I forgot the couple that, that tried to hold back their what they sold, but so it, very quickly this flesh entered in, and once once people uh, that the flesh interferes, uh, then uh, you know communism can't work. So that's why communism fails everywhere it's tried all over the world. I remember that there's a story about the pilgrims. When they first came to America, the first year, they, they agreed to just share everything, kind of like they, this was their model. They would, everything was, was uh, nobody had any individual property ownership. But then at the first year, they're all about to starve. And then the leader, who was like the governor at that time, I wish I knew the names of these people, but these were, I think, the pilgrims. But they, uh, uh, there was a decision made that everybody could keep their own, whatever they produced. They'd have their own piece of land, and whatever they produced, they got to keep. And at that time, that's far, the starvation stopped, and they were able to, pr to prosper, because that's the only system that works um, uh, unless man is totally devoted to the community. Yeah, but you can't. This devotion to community only lasts so long when, because the flesh interferes with it. Um, so, um, well, I guess that's my thoughts. I've, I've wanted to talk about that that portion of scripture and the idea of this communal living. I've I wanted to say that for a long time. So, what's your reaction to all that? Who are you speaking to, Luke? I think we agreed that you were going to go first each time. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Luke. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think it's uh, obvious that your Democrat leanings are coming out. If you start chanting Bernie, I'm going to have to mute you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, uh, what what comes across to me here is what you said is, is all true, uh, of course. But... You know, what comes to my mind when reading this is what I'm told happened to me when I was eight years old. Uh, I went, I did the old Baptist uh, thing and uh, went down the aisle and accepted the Lord. And I have very, very little memory uh, of that time of being eight years old, but I do remember going down front. I do remember accepting the Lord. And I'm told that for the next, I don't know how long, that my mother received calls from neighbors uh, to my parents saying, please, we tell Joe to let up on the Jesus stuff. That's all he talks about. Our kids are going to go to church with you guys. Now tell him just to back off and mellow out. That's Everything's good. And, and I'm told that I would stop strangers at the store to tell them about Jesus. And, and my passion uh, uh, for, for Christ was uh, unparalleled. I was a little Luke out on the street. Uh, just doing my street preaching at eight years old. And uh, I think that, that this section of verses is not only uh, uh, indicative of a, of a political system, but, but a heart state. And, uh, and I, I, I've said many times I was a better man at eight years old than I am today uh, because I was new in Christ back then, and, uh, and I've lost some passion. I, I am proud to say uh, and it was brought back to mind. I've mentioned it to you before, Luke, that uh, back before Mary got sick, I used to have poker night once a week. And we'd go house to house was our routine, is, is common. And uh, 
and I, I, when they came to my house, I had a jar. Anytime they said the F word, they, they had to put in a buck. And, uh, and I was so pleased when uh, I had a belly laugh about it, but looking back on it, it was wonderful. They had a J jar because if I kept talking about Jesus, whenever I bring him up, I had to put a buck in the J jar when I was in other people's homes. And so uh, I think there's a great passion for Christ shown here that bled into every part of their lives. And I think the names you're looking for was Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, so uh, back to you. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was quite a tangent you went off on there, Brother Joe. But I'm glad you did. I enjoyed all that. Uh, but uh, well, let me just. Um, I, I hope you heard everything I said in regarding the uh, communal living uh, and that it didn't get the impression that I was uh, saying that this is a feasible system for mankind, uh, communism. It doesn't work. It's proved it didn't work with these, uh, the first church. It didn't work with the pilgrims. It doesn't work anywhere in the world, but uh, that's because uh, we're not, we're not uh, you know, uh, glorified bodies living in eternity, then then the flesh won't interfere with, with all that. But uh, um, Okay, Brother Ted, your thoughts about Brother Joe's comments too. Well, <laughs> I'll go ahead and say about Joe's statements. I, I like that. I liked hearing that. And, uh, you know, he called it a tangent or whatever. You know, some, some rabbit trails are good to go down. I like that, so I, I can definitely appreciate that. That's uh, that's good stuff. Um, I think the thing about these verses is that these people that uh, you know, obviously seeing the signs of, uh, the, I mean, beginning back with the, the the Holy Spirit coming there on the day of Pentecost, and it talks about uh, in verse 43 in our context the signs and wonders uh, done by the apostles. I mean. These people, like I said, were these were people who were all in, and uh, it, it says, uh, I don't know how the other versions, but it says in verse 42, they continued steadfastly. I mean, there wasn't just kind of this lethargic approach or even half-hearted approach to be like, well, I'll, I'll hang around the apostles today, but nah, I'll, I'll see them in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go do my own thing. People were just, people were really into this, and for obvious reason, and uh there was continual fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, and uh, the whole communal thing. Luke, I, I think I don't think it was uh, commanded either. I think it was all voluntary. I think it was all voluntary, and I think it was all out of just a willingness coming directly from their hearts. And um, you know, I, I think that's just a fulfillment of of the new covenant really working in people. I'll take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Um, that's that's what causes people to walk in in his statutes and in his commandments to this day, uh, and I don't think uh, communal living was commanded by any of the apostles. I think it was all voluntary, brother. So uh, pretty pretty evident to me from the text. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's a very important point for people to get that uh, uh, we don't have any indication that um, someone laid down the law that. Everybody must to sell everything and give it to the apostles, and we'll we'll sh we'll dole it out for based on the needs. And no, that's not not what happened at all. And that goes right along with the rest of the the New Testament writings that uh, giving has to always be voluntary, uh, rather than uh, you know a, a, a ten percent rate or whatever it is. But I'll read a little further now. Um, we're almost finished with this chapter. It says, verse 46 says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. All right. That's the end of chapter 2. Uh, Brother Joe, your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's I think it's kind of neat that uh, it wasn't just the three thousand that, that this was a continuous uh, uh, gaining to to the body of Christ, and and uh, the fact that they were moving from house to house shows a great communion together. Uh, it's all it came to mind uh, while Ted was speaking. You know, back in the day, there wasn't a a big middle class. Uh, 
it seems to me that there were the poor and then there were the well-to-do. I don't think they had a, a big middle class. And so uh, I think their compassion uh, uh, was overwhelming towards their newfound brothers in the Lord. And so uh, uh, I, I just I just love seeing how they were moving as, as one family and uh, and actually going from house to house and 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 uh, it must have been a little piece of heaven uh, to be there and uh, 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 the regeneration or the the new newness of their their uh, spirit was is so evident and uh, wow I, I could hardly wait until uh, Christ returns because I, I think we're going to fall back uh, into this wonderful place that they were for a short time. And, you know, I, I, I know coming up further in this chapter, you know, there starts to be complaints, you know, hey, if you're not going to work, you can't eat. So some of the poor were taking advantage of some of the generosity and the flesh enters in and the old man starts corrupting. So uh, for this time, what a, what a blessing, what a, what a neat thing it would have been to see. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. All right. Very interesting. Thank you, Brother Ted. Well, e excellent, Joe, and, and thank you. That, you know, I think uh, the thing that, that jumps out to me uh, of this whole passage, uh, 45 through 47, is just uh, is unity. That's the that's the word that came to my mind. It's just unity. Um, and down, uh, it says in verse 46. Uh, how they did eat their bread uh, with gladness, eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I mean, there's all kinds of all kinds of uh, descriptions there. These descriptive terms like singleness of heart, uh, thankfulness, praising God, and uh, wow, you know, I look at that and I think when <clears throat> when Christians or people in general, even people that haven't come to faith in Christ yet. Uh, I, I think the thing that uh, that keeps us humble and the thing that keeps us uh, uh, in perspective in life is is uh, thankfulness. I, I, I've said before, I heard it from somebody else, but I think uh, the most Christian, in quotation marks, the most Christian holiday is Thanksgiving, uh, in my mind, here in America, uh, because of, uh, I don't know what other nations observe, but... Um, you know, you have to be thankful to somebody. You have, it's all about being thankful, and uh, majoritively speaking, it's it's about being thankful to God, even if people don't really know Him yet. Uh, so these, those terms like singleness of heart, gladness, thankfulness, praising God, uh, those all those all point to me at, at speak to me to, as unity, unity among those people, and there was a real humbleness uh, going on there, and I think I think that is. Uh, just like Joe said, a little taste of heaven, a little taste of the kingdom right there. Uh, and um, I think we could do, do well to, to note that. Back to you. Well, you, you both did an excellent job of giving your thoughts on those verses. I liked it very much. I, I think the only thing uh, not covered very much was the, the term house to house. So let me talk about that. It's... Um, not only this is the first time we're getting this impression, but if we look at, uh, I think especially in Paul's letters, uh, he's always referring to the house, the, the church at this person's house and the church at that person's house. And, uh, nowhere does it say the church that was uh, uh, on the corner of this this street here, and here and this is that building, you know, that huge building that we all built for all us to come. No, that's not that. Nobody even imagined such a thing. Churches were, were gatherings in people's homes. Uh, that's that's the model that we see in, in the New Testament, uh, the example. Uh, and I think when people, when rather than uh, being getting the impression that well, there's too many people, we need to build build a building. Uh, the impression I get is that there's too many people. Someone else needs to open up their home too. So. So we'll have uh, more home churches. Um, I, you know, I attended a lot of churches over the years. Uh, uh, many years ago, I en ended up at a, a, a home church, and 
I was there, I think, for a year or so, and it was a wonderful experience. But I, I had to leave because of a doctrinal argument that I couldn't tolerate with a, the, the pastor. Or, or, let's just say pastor, I don't know, the, the person that owned the house that was the leader of the group. And, and so so I, I ended up having people come into my house. And it grew, and it went on uh, it, it, for seven years. I, I think it was a, a type of home church. Um, we prayed together, we worshiped together, we had music, we had uh, uh, sh shared uh, our uh, thoughts, tried to help each other with, with any need. We got to know each other very well in small group settings of five or 10 or 20 people or so. Then that's when you get to know people and, and that's when there's really true fellowship goes on. Uh, and when you have a church with thousands of people, there's no fellowship because it's too, it's not personal enough. Uh, and of course, there was plenty of Bible study uh, uh, at my home. And uh, unfortunately, after seven years, though, people went their separate ways. And and this is, as you said, this is church now for you. Well, this is church for me too. This is this is what I have now, and this is this is the best uh, that uh, in terms of Bible study, studying and learning together, worshiping together, praying together. And not only is it the, the three of us, but some people are maybe watching this live. Some people will watch it later. And so I, I do consider this my church, the Internet. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, we'll go on to the next chapter. But any, any thoughts on that idea there, Brother Joe? Yeah, it, it reminds me. Now, I don't know this guy's doctrine a lot, but the largest church in the world uh, is uh, or at least was a, a guy named Watchman Nee, and again I don't know his doctrines that much, but uh, he started a uh, church in South Korea, and it's completely based on on the home church concept, and uh, I do believe they have a rather large uh, building, but the primary function of the church is is to organize the home groups, and uh, I forget how many hundreds of thousands uh, are members there. But uh, I, I think that the concept uh, is absolutely biblical and, and away from the structure that has caused so much corruption. You know, my, my kids went to a, a church uh, school uh, in, in uh, Tacoma, Washington, and it just, it, it, the, the 501c3 corporation end of it and the, the money and the building, it, it just somehow, uh, they're, they're become status and cliques and organizations that uh, I, I just don't I don't find uh, is is uh, refreshing like this was and uh, granted mankind has a, a problem with flesh for instance I love this home church to the three of us uh, three of us to have especially since you and Ted can't eat my Doritos but yet we're having a home fellowship uh, this is awesome uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that we would do well, and I think we're going to be forced in the future to do well with home churches. And where's the strongest churches in the world right now? Uh, in persecuted areas. And the persecuted areas are all pretty much home churched. So uh, a lot to be said for home churches. But I do want to make one point on what Ted said. I could go all day and talk about thanks thankfulness. It's no surprise to me that the people who started Thanksgiving were Puritans, uh, pilgrims, uh, uh, people of God. And uh, I've never met someone who, who had good character that was not thankful in, in his uh, in his state, no matter what it is. Back to you guys. Huh. Very interesting. Um, uh, do, do you know who has a, a playlist titled Watchman Knee? Uh, that would be you. <laughs> That's true. Go to my playlist, Watchman Nee. I'm a big, a big fan. I, I love Watchman Nee. His, I haven't read his writings, but uh, I've got audio of a lot of his uh, teachings. I believe it's his own voice uh, too on the, on the uh, video. There's no really no video. It's just all audio. But um, I didn't find anything in his doctrine that I didn't agree with. So uh, unless there's something I'm not aware of, I can give him a complete endorsement. Uh, Brother Ted. Well, a lot of a lot of good stuff from both of you guys there. Um, 
uh, and I've heard a lot of good things about Watchman Nee. Some of the some of the Christian authors, and I'm I'm into just very very few Christian authors, uh, but the ones that I'm into uh, kind of all have the same theme of uh, the Christian life. You know, by faith is uh, the secret to it. The the, the, the the real sweet point of it is uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, uh, Galatians 2:20. You know, uh, the the indwelling Christ, and I think that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's a, a lot of what Watchman Nee's uh, theology and teachings based on. Praise God. Uh, but uh, the house to house thing, I'm I'm totally all in on that. Uh, the house church, uh, quite frankly, guys, and Joe just touched on this, and this is what I was going to say. It it could be the way, and I'm thinking, uh, depending on how things go, uh, let's just say in November, uh, and in the coming days, because we know Scripture has to be fulfilled no matter what happens. Uh, but uh, I think it, the house church could be the way it's going to go, uh, or the most feasible, feasible and logical way for, for a church to go. Uh, I think with what's going on, and quite frankly, to eliminate all these problems of, you know, I think Joe talked about the tax thing, tax status of 501c3, and quite frankly, the whole thing of marriage. Uh, you know, uh, if the homos, homosexuals are going to uh, try to force pastors to 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 marry them or or lose their charitable uh, uh, don charitable uh, status uh, with the government, then uh, quite frankly, I just think. Uh, the thing to do would be do no marriages. Uh, and quite frankly, I, I would leave marriages to the state. I know pastors are ordained. I've, I've been ordained before. I've never performed a marriage. But I think the way to eliminate all that and, and having to, to fight against that would just be not in the marriage business. Leave it to the justice of the peace. Leave it to the state. Um, and, uh, you know, with the 501c3 issue, the marriage issue, the persecution that's coming, the government that's going to be coming against us, uh, I think the way to go would be to go to house church. Now, I've been a part of a house church when I lived in California for a short time. It was a little too far for us for, to drive at the time, uh, but but it was a real blessing. Like you said, Luke, it wasn't that big mega church where you you don't have that close fellowship. It it was truly some of the some of the sweetest times of Christian fellowship I've ever had. So. And the epistles talk about that, as you said, the church that's in this house, the church that's in Chloe's house, the church that's in this house. That was the early church. Uh, the Christians weren't certainly allowed to go meet uh, in the synagogue and, you know, have the Lord's Supper and perform baptism and stuff. That that just wasn't the way it was back then. I think we probably would do well to go go back. Back to you. <coughs> well. The um, I I, th I think it was Peter that um, uh, preached against um, or wrote against, the, and the term is filthy lucre. Uh, I've always loved that that term. Uh, just uh, you know, money, gre greediness, being in it for the money, getting into uh, religion because of the business opportunity in it, rather than for the right reason. Um, Paul was very careful to not ever um, give, let anybody ever accuse him of that. He, he, he said that he even continued working as a tent maker so that he could provide for himself and not have, have to be dependent and, and ever be accused of being in it for the money. But what happens is uh, if, if, they were, if, if it never changed from just home churches, and um, they, you wouldn't have overhead. When you, when you decide you're going to buy a building, and you have expenses to buy it, to maintain it, then uh, then who's going to pay the expenses? And then who's going to? And if you're going to have a pastor that's full time. How's he going to exist without a, a a salary for him and his family? So then, because of these expenses, um, it it ends, it ends up being turned into a, a, a business. And then some of it find they realize that. They can actually get rich at it, and we have a lot of famous, uh, especially on television, um, people that are they have these giant churches, and they're making millions and millions of dollars annually, and and living in a in a manner where they may have 20 Rolls Royces, and that this is it's it should be so obvious to anybody who has any kind of spiritual discernment. 
that this is wrong. Uh, it shouldn't even have to be spoken out against. It should be that obvious. But I think this this was a progression when people left the home church concept. That's, that's what it led to. I'm going to go to the next chapter now. Uh, let me see. So now we're in chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. So ninth, that would be 3 p.m. Uh, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Uh, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have uh, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Brother Joe? What a well-known uh, passage and uh, awesome, really. I mean, number one, uh, it shows that Peter and John uh, were not uh, not wealthy men, and uh, they said they had none. I, I take them at their word. Uh, so they were not among uh, the wealthier congregants of their of their new body and uh, so that's something to note uh, <clears throat> I, I also note that uh, we have miracles you know the apostolic miracles happening uh, it's mentioned earlier a couple of verses back that uh, fear came upon the people and, and that of wonder not not of uh, adrenaline at, at the at the acts that were that were happening through the Holy Spirit to establish the church and uh, what comes to my mind also here uh, is uh, I can't separate it from the verses we were just discussing because uh, a church that I went to for many years uh, a rather large church uh, I was in uh, visiting uh, an assistant pastor who would ask me something or other and I was talking with him and I noticed someone came in and, and they needed uh, money for antibiotics for their for their daughter and they said well you'll need to fill out this form but I'll tell you right now we don't give money for that because uh, we could be sued if if she took the antibiotics and was allergic or there was some problem can you bring in a heating bill or something maybe we can put that in pay that and then you'll have money for this and you know I I looked around the church that was millions of dollars worth of building. I noticed the staff of at least a dozen full time, well paid, fifty thousand and up. And I said to myself, my gosh, you know, I, I noted that year that there was uh, four percent of the annual budget donated to missions. Yeah, I, I, I think the home church is pretty important. Uh, I hope we get back to it. But as to these verses here, uh, what a wonderful thing, man. The Holy Spirit was moving. And uh, uh, that's all I have to say. Back to you. All right. All right. Brother Ted? Yeah, amen. And I just quickly what Joe was saying there, I, I think that's one more reason probably to to go to the home church in order for the to – Avoid the legal issues, like I said last time, with the whole uh, legalities of tax status and what have you, and uh, to avoid getting sued. I, I can understand, um, but I think the, the 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 real thing I note in that passage is he was lame from birth. Uh, this man was lame, and uh, verse four, when you know three, when Peter and John went into the temple, it says Peter fastening his eyes on him. He was really, you know, intently looking at him with John, and he said, "Look at us." And I think, I think Peter wanted him to, uh, the man, to look at him and just say, "Look, we're not another passerby that's going to dr drop another uh, coin in your cup." You know, 
uh, you're important to us. I think I think that's important to realize there, um, and I think that's what Christ does in our hearts. I think uh, he he puts people in our paths and he puts people in our paths for a reason, so we can so we can be a blessing to them. And uh, the guy, you know, paid attention and he says, uh, you know, he was expecting to receive something of them. And Peter says, look, I don't have gold and silver, <laughs> you know. So look at look at the value that the world places on things. The world says, I, you know, who's got the most silver? Who's got the most gold? That's what, uh, you know, the golden rule. He, he who has the gold makes the rules. But the real value of this guy that was lame from birth, uh, the real value, what he got was what he received, what Peter gave him. Peter says, what I have, you know, is not silver and gold, but what I, I give you is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the real value that that guy got, brothers, was what he received, and that was the use of his legs. And, uh, you know, think about that. If, if I was in that position, all the money in the world wouldn't do me any good if I didn't have the use of my legs. So that was the real thing. The real value was was what he received. So uh, back to you, brother. Hmm. Um, well, a lot of interesting uh, points. I, the thing that stands out to me first, of course, in that very first verse, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Um, so they're, they're still going to the temple. Now the temple is not a, it, it's this, this, as we said, these are, they're meeting in people's homes. They haven't built any uh, buildings uh, that we, we refer to as church buildings. And this is this temple is uh, where the the Jewish people gather for the for the, the temple worship. And so this is still Judaism here. They they go into the temple. Um, I'm assuming it doesn't say it, but I'm assuming that they go into the temple and they do all the things that the people do in a temple. Uh, you know. Uh, service or um, uh, they, they were still practicing the things that a, Jew, a practicing Jew would practice uh, and we know that there's going to come a point where they're going to have to set that aside and, and, and leave that behind as we go through Acts and then when we look at Romans and, and Galatians and Hebrews especially realize that this was one of the big mistakes in the early church thinking that uh, they would they would continue to practice Judaism in, in addition to believing in, in Jesus. Um, but the, the the idea of uh, them not having any money, I thought you know sometimes that kind of went over, over my head when I first uh, read it. Joe, uh, you brought it up. It should seem real obvious when it says they had no money, but this, this just reinforces what we're talking about. They weren't in it for the money. It wasn't like that they were already, hey, everybody's um, pitching in together. Uh, everybody's sold and sharing, so we have a bag full of silver now, you know. No, they didn't have any money carrying, carrying around money with them. Uh, now, I don't know. Uh, as we read on, maybe we'll find out, but I don't recall this person ever any indication that he ends up believing and being saved. I I suspect he would. I don't think they would neglect telling him the gospel and leading him to Christ. But the, what they're offering at this point is uh, the ability to walk. They're going to heal him. And, and uh, the, there's, a, um, there's a saying that I saw on a church wall once. And it's a beautiful statement. It, it says that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So, you know, I, I, it's kind of the opposite expression that I've said a lot of times too. I, I, I've said that, uh, you know, if, if we were to go out and feed the homeless and give them clothes and do all these good works, but we didn't ever tell them about Jesus, we've only fed them for a day. You know, we've only clothed them as temporary help, but uh, we the, these mission works that people, that, like particularly Roman Catholicism, they do a lot of works like that. But they're, they're neglecting what's really most important. Instead of just a temporary fix to feed them, they need to give them the gift of eternal life. 
but so that's that's an important that uh, we don't neglect what's really the most important thing we can give them. But on the other hand, uh, people sometimes don't want to listen to us just giving a sermon, just you know, wanting to talk to them about Jesus when they have a need. They can't think about anything else. They're not going to listen to the gospel. They're in pain. They need medicine. He, they're crippled. They, 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 so he addressed the first most immediate need here. But I, I would assume that once he's able to walk, that they, they didn't neglect telling the gospel. Um, before I go on, any more thoughts on it, any of this? Yeah, a, a little bit. Uh, I like what you said. I love that sign. Uh, but, you know, the Bible says, uh, you know, a cup of water is just a cup of water, but a cup of water in the name of Christ is living water. Uh, I don't recall Christ ever saying, I mean, he healed everyone that came to him, with the notable exception of Nazareth, I guess, but uh, you know, he didn't uh, say, okay, if you believe in me, uh, I'll heal you. I, that was, to my knowledge, never done. And uh, uh, he always uh, uh, healed, and then people believed, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think we're called to uh, dangle carrots, but rather to freely give them and uh, in the name of Christ. Back to you. Yeah, Brother Ted, any more thoughts on that? Well, I think we're going to see in the context there that, that Peter did, he, he obviously did give another sermon, and I would think that this lame man of all the people there would have been one to certainly believe, because he, he saw the disciples, or the apostles' love for him, not only, like you said, Luke, uh, giving of, of his physical need, you know, and having, having him walk again, but then giving him the truth of the gospel um, in the verses ahead. And uh, that's the real good news that uh, is going to go, you know, throughout all eternity. So I'll, I'll let you carry on with that, brother. Good word. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would suspect more than anybody else, uh, he would be interested in hearing more. Oh, hey, wait a second. I'm, you just healed me. Uh, I've been lame f from from birth. I think that's what it said. How does, how does this read again? says, uh, a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Yeah, so he's been lame, crippled his whole life. And now he, he's going to be able to walk. Well, that is not something just to just, uh, you know, um, glaze over. And, uh, you know, if that happened to any of us, we'd certainly want to know more about the people and how they're able to do that. So there, his interest would be certainly piqued in wanting to know more. So uh, I, I think we can assume that they told him about Jesus and, Certainly, because of the signs and wonders. That's the whole point of these signs and wonders. Uh, it, uh, it, they're not just to, you know, show off or just to even for, for the goodness of, of wanting to heal people and feed them. That's that's certainly a worthy reason to help people. But uh, uh, they were there for a purpose to be convincing proofs, infallible proofs. Uh, that uh, wait a second, this is the works of God. Um, all right, I'll read a little further. Um, uh, Rise up and walk, he says. Verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, he leaping up, st stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God, Oh. All right, Brother Joe. Yeah, I, you got to love that. You know, I, I think that uh, I think Peter uh, and John were not going to the temple so much to uh, 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 have a time of prayer as a time of witnessing uh, for Christ uh, in the in the uh, den of snakes, and uh, this guy. Uh, now, he, he says he, he lifted him with his right hand. If, if your mind works like mine, why does it say his right, his right hand? Well, why mention? Why not just say he lifted him up by the hand? Why his right hand? There's something there. I have no idea. But uh, I know there's some reason that it, it, it mentions his right hand. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, 
I think they were there to witness the gospel to, to the Pharisees and, and the people who had not yet heard the gospel. And uh, this is a great way to make an entrance, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we, we, we should be glad that he lifted him with his right hand instead of lifting him with his wrong hand. Brother Ted? <laughs> oh, that's how I have to come on? <laughs> i got to start on with a laugh. That's great, Brother. Well, uh, Joe's question is a good one, and I think uh, from other places in the Bible, I think uh, the, the terminology right right hand has a has a has a meaning of preference. You know, uh, I immediately thought of uh, the sheep on the goat and the goats in Matthew uh, 24 or 25. There, when it's the end of the age and Christ divided is dividing the sheep and the goats, and uh, boy. The ones on his right hand are the sheep. The ones on his left hand are the goats. Uh, you know, God the Father in the Psalms, it says, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies, you know, a footstool. I think it's an idea of preference. And uh, I think uh, Peter is showing, you know, attention to this guy. He's showing a real care and concern that's, uh, that at that moment Peter is preferring to put his mind and his heart and his attention on this one man that really has a need, and um, you know, I, I think that's that's the, if there's any insinuation about you know the use of those words in the Bible, right hand. I think that's what what is inferred here. Um, but just the fact of, that he's leaping up, uh, walked, entered the temple, and then walking and leaping and praising God, and uh, that's that's just go. Isn't there a kid's song? You know uh, about that, so yeah, I love that, brother. Uh, I mean, the text says it all, and uh, this guy's overjoyed. He's fired up. Back to you. Yeah, I, there's there's something about the the fact you know to to Joe the the right hand, and there must be some great meaning in in there that we 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 need to understand. I, I, but to me, the, the thing that I want, I think is really exciting is the fact that he's leaping. He doesn't just stand up. You know, he, he, he's not standing up like carefully and, oh, now he can walk. It'd be like Jesus coming out, out of the tomb when they say that he was, uh, uh, what was the, the word when, when they say he didn't really die, but he was in some state of, uh, forgot what the name that that word is, uh, Remember when we did the study on that, and they called it, he was like in a, a state of something. But in other words, if Jesus hadn't really died, but he came out of the tomb, I mean, he'd been all crippled and just in a horrible mess, that wouldn't have been very convincing that, hey, it is, he's, he's got the victory. Well, this guy, if he just stood up, and now he's able to walk, he can barely stand up, and, you know, and just, no, this this is the opposite extreme. He not only can stand and walk, but he can leap. So he's exceedingly healed, and it's just really, it makes it even more exciting and joyful to read. Um, all right. Uh, let me read on here. Uh, verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Um, all right, we'll stop at that point there. Go ahead, Brother Joe. Well, if, if my uh, supposition is right, they weren't there for uh, structured prayer in the ninth hour. They were there to uh, spread the gospel to the Pharisees and, and to the, the, Isra the people of Israel that uh, had not yet heard the gospel. And uh, like I said, what, a, what an entrance. And, and how, how do the Pharisees now say, this gospel is nonsense. Don't listen to these guys. <laughs> Instead, they got everyone in the, the the guy they healed is hanging on to them. Hey, I'm with these guys. Look at me, and and everybody's just like, 
wow, that's the guy's been crippled all his life that we see every day. And one of the Pharisees uh, going to come out and say, and don't listen to these guys. Don't listen to them. This Jesus is uh, uh, crucified and gone. They're, they're just uh, silly people. They can't say that. They've just established the credibility of the gospel uh, through an apostolic miracle. And uh, now look where they're at. They're not inside the temple. They're outside the temple uh, where the crowds can see them and the Pharisees can't shoo them away. I think uh, that's, uh, that's street preaching 101 for, for good ideas. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Yeah, good points. Brother Chad? Uh, yeah, I think that's that's excellent. I mean, the, the thing that jumps out to me again is is the joy of this guy, uh, the joy of this guy, and he uh, he's just leaping and walking and jumping up and down and praising God. Uh, I mean, the guy's obviously uh, you know having over overwhelming. This is euphoric. This guy's ecstatic, and uh, as Joe was pointing out, there we're going to see later on in the chapter. Uh, What's going to come up uh, uh, in chapter four is uh, the Pharisees and the uh, certain priests and scribes or Sadducees are going to come to them and say, "Wait a minute, you know, no, listen, <laughs> don't listen. That's terrible." And I think uh, if there's any correlation to what goes on today, the sad, sad thing to me is you see people nowadays. You see a young guy or or whoever, any age person, you see someone get saved. And it always seems like uh, the devil's got somebody positioned uh, nearby or soon to come, you know, who's going to come on the scene and mock them and try to discount uh, the uh, the joy and the change that's happened in someone's life with with salvation or what God's done for them. And uh, it's just it's just a sad state of fire affair. Someone, you know. From the dark side, let's say, just always wants to throw water on the fire, you know. Um, so uh, it's sad. We're we're gonna see. Peter preaches a great sermon here, but we'll we'll see how it ends up. So, thanks, brother. Carry on. You know, on the it's it's really uh, establishing that there's no can be no doubt that this man was lame, and not only from birth but but he's been there doing getting asking for alms for a long time and, and there's a lot of people familiar with him so it, it, it could not ever be uh, thought that uh, this is not truly a lame person that's just asking asking for money and trying to you know you know I, I, I think even today we, we know that some people are out there asking we'll work for food on the corner you know and and it's a, it's a business for them, and they're really uh, they just don't want a job, but they're not really you know hurting, they're not really crippled or whatever. It's a, there's scams going on, and people unfortunately, um, uh, people take advantage of uh, man's um, natural concern for his fellow man and wanting to be kind and help people out, and some people will take advantage of that, and and it's it's not legitimate. In this case, I think the beginning verses there. Are, or, or making it clear that this is a legitimate person. They're truly lame, and and now this is our true healing. And that's why when it says they were greatly wondering, I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> Let's suppose that you were one of the witnesses to all of this, and you know this was somebody that you knew, and you knew that they'd been crippled, and they had not only. Uh, you're certain that they were truly crippled, and you've known them for many years, and then all of a sudden. People lift him up and he's walking and healed and leaping around. I mean, you are going to, a crowd's going to gather and greatly wonder. So these signs and wonders, maybe that's why they're called wonders. <laughs> I never really thought about that before, but uh, it makes people wonder. I want to know, how did this happen? I, I, this is so remarkable, so miraculous. I need to, I want to know the source of this. Uh, so that was really the purpose of, of the, all of these miracles. It wasn't just acts of kindness, but just as Jesus did his miracles to uh, give uh, uh, proof of his identity, these apostles are also using this to, uh, and it's, a, it's proof of their identity as, as a, the, uh, the apostles of Jesus. 
uh, to give legitimacy to their to their uh, their positions. Um, I'll read a little further now. It says um, verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, "Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us?" as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. All right, Brother Joe. Uh, not the not the right thing to say in a in a Jewish temple if you're trying to uh, win over the leadership. That's for sure. Uh, I I like what uh, what they said. You know, this is not us. You know, this is God, and and furthermore, the God that we crucified uh, and you know uh, I like what Ted said you know as soon as someone has a miraculous uh, event uh, someone wants to go throw water on it as the Pharisees will soon try to do uh, I, I'm thinking of uh, Benny Inn I have a family member who was uh, a great devotee of Benny Inn and so many others the Kenneth Copeland's and the faith movements Dad Hagen all those guys you know, they all seek attention, and, and uh, the, the congregation goes to see them. And uh, Christ said, a, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks signs and wonders, uh, yet where Christ goes, signs and wonders follow. And so I, I love how they divert, them, divert the attention from themselves, much like the Holy Spirit does, and place it on Christ. Uh, and so uh, people are aware, you know, it's like when the angel appears, and you don't bow down to me, you know. We should always be directing uh, the, the attention of whoever we're talking to towards Christ, uh, something that's, that's not done uh, very much anymore. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, Brother Chad? Yeah, excellent, excellent points, guys. Um, I think, uh, you know, the thing that's so amazing is uh, in verses 12 through 14, Peter is just saying, you know, why do you, why do you marvel at this, at this event? Why, why uh, do you look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? Uh, you know, we're no better than any of you guys. You know, I think he could probably say we're, we're better off, you know, because we believe in Jesus. I've, I've, I've tried to say that to people when they start pressing me for my beliefs or whatever. I say, listen, I'm not, I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm, you know, we're really no better than anybody. We're just, we're just better off. He, and right in verse 13, he, he goes right back to the name of Christ. You know, he says, uh, and he points out uh, there's a history behind this uh, authority, guys. He says, listen, guys, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, as Jews, as Israelites, the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. I mean, what are you marveling? I mean, this is the same Jesus that you guys saw do miracles throughout all this region, and you guys turned him over to Pilate and had him crucified. And now he's risen from the dead, and he's performing miracles through us. There's nothing to be surprised about. But ye, you guys, denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. They, they call for Barabbas. And I love the phrase... And you killed the Prince of Life, you know. And we've said on here before, uh, and it goes without saying that the the issue of salvation is a get is an issue of life and death. And if you guys killed the Prince of Life, the Holy One, the Just One, the Prince of Life, and desired a murderer instead, 
my goodness, you know, uh, you, you guys crucified the only option, but look at the very next half of the verse. <laughs> it doesn't end there. God raised him up from the dead, and now you guys are eyewitnesses of it. So Peter's saying, look, don't marvel at this. You guys have been seeing signs and wonders, you guys that have been around Jerusalem and this whole region for three, three and a half years now. So don't be marveling at this. You've got to deal with a name, the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, back to you, brother. Hmm. Yeah, very good points. Um, it, it is uh, it's true that the, the many times the apostles, and Paul does this also, where people want to... Uh, I think that the, that individual is the one that is uh, a god or that needs to be worshipped or uh, praised. And they always uh, refer them back to Jesus and give the credit to Jesus. Je and Jesus did it. In, 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 he he always, always gave him credit to the Holy Spirit working through him or the Father. I can't do anything unless the Father uh, does it. So... Uh, it's interesting how they, they're always uh, referring back to, to the other uh, part of the Godhead, and the, the apostles are always referring back to, G to Jesus. So, the but this sermon by Peter is much like the that first one, where he's first convicting them, uh, and and, uh, and and basically wanting them to repent. The word repent doesn't appear here. But this is what he he's really wants them to do is change their mind and recognize that wait a second you were wrong about Jesus the reason we did this miracle was only because Jesus is working through us the one that you didn't believe in that you you said uh, you know Pontius Pilate wanted to let him go and you said no just kill him so you're the one that you rejected that's how we did this. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's something else at the end of there I wanted to talk about. Um, oh yeah, uh, that whom God hath raised from the dead. Again, this resurrection is the recurring theme over and over and over again. They never neglect to reference the, the resurrection and that they are witnesses of the resurrection. So that's the power of the resurrection is, you know, I've said this so many times, but it's something that that always has to continue to be repeated is that uh, the Jews, I remember in the first chapter of John, the Jews asked Jesus for a sign. And he said, uh, the, the sign I'll give you is, is uh, the, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And they said, it took our fathers 40 years to build a temple. You can raise it up in three days. And it says he was referring to you know, the temple of his body. So he's referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. This is the first at the beginning of John. Then, and near the end of John, he's they, they're demanding a sign. And in, in this time span, he's done tons of miracles, and yet still, even at the end, they're still demanding a sign, a proof. And he says, "The only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah." Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of the Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And it says, again, he references his death, burial, and resurrection. So this is the sign that he promised. And then this is the sign that he delivered. He, he, he delivered on that promise that he, they're going to kill me, but I'll raise myself back to life to prove my claims are true. So um, this uh, resurrection is something that the, the uh, uh, these these apostles keep continually referencing he raised from the dead and we are witnesses to it so I'm just so I'm just and that, that study we did on uh, more than a carpenter really really brought that uh, home to me more than I had uh, uh, more than I had remembered well, it's been so long since I read the book but the, the importance of the resurrection you know I've always said it's this it's the proof that or gives us confidence in putting our faith in Jesus, but it's it's so important that they kept on repeating it, and and then Paul wrote First Corinthians chapter fifteen because that resurrection is so important, and that resurrection today for me and each of us, that's what really gives us the confidence that that okay, 
This is not just blind faith. The resurrection uh, was done so that we can believe with confidence. Um, well, it looks, let me see how much more, if we can cover anything else before we go on. Go. Uh, well, we only have 12 minutes left, so I, let me, we'll, we'll pick up with verse 16 next time. Let me, let me make a note of that so I don't forget where we are next time. So it'll be uh, 3, oh, 316. Have you noticed all the 316 verses? There's so many real prominent 316 verses. Okay. Uh, let's take a minute, each of us, to just kind of summarize our uh, thoughts on the study to, today, and, and then I'll, a couple of minutes, so, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the gospel. Okay, Brother Joe? Well, it's been a it's been a real good study. A lot of a lot of stuff uh, thought about, and uh, I, I guess if I had to summarize, uh, it's uh, the change. The real miracles are not so much this lame guy getting up, although that was a, a great miracle. The real miracle is the changed lives, the three thousand that grew daily. Uh, I don't think uh, many of them. Uh, experienced uh, uh, healings, but uh, the greatest miracle of all is faith in Christ. And so uh, I'm not so impressed with healings as I am with uh, with uh, eternal life given. And so uh, I just love the spirit and the, the, uh, the communion of the body of Christ at its inception. Uh, it's wonderful to see. Back to you, Luke. All right, thanks. Brother Ted? Yeah, well, I agree with that. And, you know, backing up into Chapter 2 and then here into Chapter 3, uh, you know, the change in these people's lives, you know, the, the, the cool Christian life to these guys, you know, uh, sure seems to me like that it was a way of life. It wasn't just a, a, a Sunday-only Christianity. I mean, they were breaking bread house to house, sharing goods, uh, continuing daily together, uh, you know, singleness of heart and mind, all these terms that the, that, that the Bible gives here. Uh, Peter and John looks like they're looking for an opportunity to, to be a blessing, to share Christ, or, uh, you know, to at least focus on God to see how, you know, they would, got, if, they, if this lame man wasn't even here, I'm sure that their time in the temple would have been just one to uh, to pray and, and seek God and and see how they could be used to him used by him being a, being available to God and uh, the, the the way of life uh, in these early believers here in Acts two and three just seemed to be uh, what they were all about. It was a complete transformation, and I think it was because of a realization of of the great transaction that had taken place in their life. I mean, uh, they truly had the living Christ living in them. Uh, and it, obviously, it was on display in works of miracles from the apostles, but uh, there was obviously a change that came into the heart uh, of these people, and they really they really lived it out, uh, you know, uh, as individuals and as a, as a group, as a body. So uh, good stuff we've got going on there, brother. Thanks. Back to you. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for participating. I enjoyed it very much, as usual. Uh, a lot of great uh, things came out of this study. I, I, I've said this so many times that, you know, the, the Bible, it, most people think the Bible is a book, but it's actually a, a compilation, or a collection of, of 66 books in one. Uh, and it was, um, it, it was written over a 1,600-year span by over 40 different authors from many different walks of life, um, written in three different continents. And, and, and yet it, it agrees on this one thing that's most important now, and, and that is that if you want to go to heaven, 
it's it's only the only way of getting to heaven is because God is gracious. God is gracious enough to give you heaven as a gift. Um, most people in the world today, and most people who have ever lived, if they do believe that uh, it's possible to go to heaven, people believe the the means of salvation is uh, through personal effort, personal merit. If you if you change your life enough and and abstain from bad behavior that you know we could call sin, um, and if you uh, not only abstain from bad behavior, but get busy doing all kinds of good works in your life. Be charitable. Be honest. You know, be kind. If you, if you do enough good and eliminate the bad in your life, then you'll go before God at the judgment and he'll say, well done. You get to come in to heaven. So people think that heaven is, is a, um, a reward for a life well lived, it's a it's a reward for good behavior, but that's not what the Bible says. See, uh, the, the the Christianity we find in the Bible says that it's impossible to get into heaven through our personal merit because the standard we have to meet is so high it's actually perfection. You can ha you have no sin at all in your whole life. Yeah, it's very strict. That's why Jesus said that it's impossible for you to achieve it through practicing religion. Uh, that's why Paul said, following the commandments, the purpose of it was just to teach you the futility of it. You need to understand that trying to work your way to heaven is uh, is doomed to failure. And then, so, but the Bible says that God loved us so much that He, he said it, He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus Christ, so that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that God does not desire that any of us should perish, but we should all come to repentance. So he doesn't want you to perish because you're futilely, uh, in vain, trying to achieve heaven for yourself. That's, that's the road to destruction. Uh, he he desires that you repent, change your mind about that as a means of salvation, reject it, and instead embrace Jesus as the means of salvation. Embrace Jesus as the only means of salvation. So the Bible says that uh, we're, we're not saved by doing religious works, we're saved by the grace of God, only because God is gracious, and we're saved through faith. Faith without any religious works on our part, and but the faith must be in the person and, and finished work of Jesus Christ. Our faith must be in this person, Jesus Christ, who is God, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, who came down from heaven, became a man, and died for our sins. Faith in that person and what he's done for you. Believe he, in fact, did pay for all your sins, and he did. You should be, if you're not aware of this, if you've never been taught this, then uh, this should be really good news. That's why it's called the gospel. It's a Greek word that means good news. The good news is that your sins are paid for. Now you can have a relationship with God. You can have eternal life, and it's offered to you as a free gift. <laughs> now, if you understand the value of that, you realize that it's, it's, it's better than hitting the lottery. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's the best news you'll ever hear in your life if you understand that you're promised eternal, eternal life, immortality in the new heavens and new earth. So it's offered to you if you want it, but there's only one way of getting it. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus claimed that he's the one and only way to get it. So just, in other words, just believe in Jesus. Believe on him. Believe in his ability alone to get you to heaven. Believe in his faithfulness to keep his promise that you're going to go to heaven. Believe on him in the respect that you're going to depend on him or rely on him alone. And when you have that kind of faith, 
you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. All right, so uh, usually they, they always say, oh, I didn't know you were going to call on me again, but I'll, I'll give you guys a, a chance to say any last word you want. First, Brother Joe. Uh, I, I have no last words, Luke, uh, except that I've enjoyed the study a great deal and, and look forward to continuing. Back to you. All right, thanks. At least you didn't have your fan blast in the way. <laughs> Brother Ted? Yeah, uh, no, just uh, thanks for that, Luke, and I hope everyone uh, keeps in mind the main reason we do it is to point people back to that, the good news, the gospel that you just gave. Thank you for that, brother. Yeah, that's a good point. Just, just as in this uh, study, at the very end, we saw that the apostles were deflecting attention from themselves and referring them to Jesus. That's, that's what we want you to know. Turn to Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him now. Uh, thank you for participating. Thank to you viewers for watching. I bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.